So I'm just going to share my screen so you can see my slides. And I'll just swap that display setting around. Perfect. Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the Science Symposium. Uh, today we are talking about machine learning and we have Dr. Didi, we have Dr. Gabriella, and we have Bina from the University of Alberta, uh, who will be presenting today. And we also have myself, my name is Ashley, I'm the Vice Chair of the Symposium, and we have Noeen in the background and she is the Chair and the Brainchild and the Driving Force behind the Symposium, so you may occasionally hear her voice as well. Now I would like to start with a land acknowledgement and just suggest that everyone takes a moment to reflect on our connection to the land and thank the traditional guardians of the land that we here at Squist Vancouver live and work on, which is the traditional unceded and ancestral lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Stolo and the Seashell and the Squamish people. So today we are in round two of the Science Symposium and we are having our second presentation by Vina in the machine learning artificial intelligence category. A few housekeeping rules before we get started. As you may have heard, today's event is being recorded and it will be going up on YouTube later today. Uh, we do ask that everyone keep themselves muted during the presentation as to not interrupt our presenters. And we do ask that if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, especially from our audience, please drop those in the chat box as we will be asking Vina those during our Q&A uh, section from the audience. Now, before we get started, I would also like to give a moment to recognize our sponsors as they um, are part of the reason we have the Science Symposium here today. So we have Northeastern University Vancouver and they have a 95 employment rate for biotechnology. So if you're interested in that area, please check them out. We also have Admare Bioinnovation. So if you want to polish your skills in business or science, check out their programs. We have Abcelera, who discovered the antibody that neutralizes the viral variants of the COVID-19. Um, COVID-19. And we also have Acutus Therapeutics, and their liquid, liquid, lipid, sorry, nanoparticle delivery system is a key element in the development of Pfizer's vaccine. Uh, and our, on the other side there, we also have Microsoft. So check their website today if you're interested in the um, internships in IT, as well as Sophos Cybersecurity. And they are an international cybersecurity firm who work closely in machine learning. So feel free to check them out if that's someone that tickles your fancy. So today we have our two judges, Dr. Vina and Dr. Gabriela, as well as our speaker, Vina, who will be presenting on her work of using machine learning to automatically measure AVR on radiographs. And I will give our judges a moment here to introduce themselves and share a little bit about their work before switching it over to you, Vina, and you'll give, you can give a little introduction about yourself and your background before jumping into your slides. So with that being said, I would like to, first of all, thank our judges for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. And I'll drop it over to you, Dr. Nita, Me Nita, sorry, <laughs> uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I think you meant Dr. Nidhi. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, all right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Nidhi Rastogi, an incoming assistant professor at Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, where my research will be focusing on artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Currently, I'm a research scientist at Grand City Polytechnic in New York. I am super excited to be attending this talk um, and, uh, you know, think myself very lucky to be judging Veena's work on a very important problem uh, on the disease of idiopathic scoliosis. I hope I pronounced it right. And I look forward to the talk. Uh, good luck, Veena. Well, and then I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Gabriela. Thank you, Ashley, and hello, everyone. I am Gabriela, and I am joining today from the University of Liverpool, where, where I am a researcher on a European project um, where we focus on applying robotic chemists to, for the material discovery. And my research interests are applied machine learning and robotics. I am also very happy to join today, and I really look forward to your presentation today, Vina. And I wish you the best of luck for the presentation today. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And with that, Vina, I will stop sharing my slides, and I'll pass it over to you to do that quick introduction and jump into the presentation. 
make sure. Okay. You guys can all see my screen, right? Yeah. We can see your slide showing the slide there. That's your presentation. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Perfect. So hi, my name is Vina. I'd first like to thank you all for coming and taking time out of your day to join me in this presentation. I'm in my third year of electrical engineering at the University of Alberta, and I've been working with Dr. Edmund Lau and Jason Wong during my third or during my eight month co-op term. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing with you guys my, pre, uh, my project on using machine learning to automatically measure the axial vertebral rotation on radiographs in adolescents with idiopathic scoliosis. So scoliosis is a 3D curvature of the spine and there are many different types of scoliosis, but today we're gonna to be focusing on idiopathic scoliosis. Idiopathic scoliosis is when the curvature of your spine changes um, from growth spurts and 3% of children are actually diagnosed with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. There's around four different parameters and measurements we use when diagnosing and treating these patients. Those include the Cobb angle, the axial vertebral rotation, which you'll commonly hear me refer to as AVR, the kyphotic and the lordotic angles. So on the right in figure one, you can see a very severe case of scoliosis. And this is just to give you an idea of how it looks like. So on this slide, we're gonna be talking about the four parameters we mentioned briefly in the previous slide. In the first image showing the Cobb angle, we have a posterior anterior radiograph, which is just an X-ray image from the front, from the back to the front of a patient. So any curve in this coronal plane has a Cobb angle associated to it. So from the first yellow line to the middle yellow line, we have one curve and that arrow in between those two lines show the angle that the Cobb angle would represent. Similarly, from the middle yellow line to the last yellow line, we have one more curve. And again, that arrow shows the angle that the Cobb angle would represent. The two images in the second column, figure 3A and 3B, represent the AVR angle. So AVR is just a rotation of the vertebrae along its vertical axis. In figure 3A, we have the parameters that we use to calculate the AVR angle, which we'll go into detail a little bit later. But in figure 3B, you can kind of see how a rotation looks like on a posterior anterior radiograph. So on this image, we have two red circles which outline um, pedicles, which are really important landmarks in determining the AVR angle. Ideally, we want these two pedicles to be at equal distances from the vertebral edges. However, you can see that the right pedicle is a lot closer to the vertebral edge than the left pedicle, suggesting a rotation. The last two angles are the kyphotic and the lordotic angles, which are any angles for curves in the sagittal profile of a patient. The kyphotic angle is for the thoracic region of the spine and the, lump, or the lordotic angle is for the lumbar region of the spine. So AVR is really important in determining the prognosis and the rate of progression for a patient. After determining the severity of the AVR, angle surgeons can discuss treatment options that are available to the patient. Misjudgment or miscalculation in the AVR angle can be very dangerous as it can lead to a delay of treatment or it can even result in misplacement of pedicle screws which can result in spinal injuries during surgery. We use Stokes method to quantitatively measure the AVR angle. So in figure six, you can see a very severe case of a rotation. This vertebrae is rotated counterclockwise, pushing the two ribs on either side of it and also contorting the vertebral body, which is the gray shaded region and the spinous process, which is the part that the very top text is pointing towards. So AVR rotations often result in rib humps, such as um, what the image shows. This can be troubling for growing children. It can affect how they view themselves and it can also cause other organs in the body to move. So some problems we have when manually measuring the AVR angle using Stokes method is that it's very time consuming and it can result in a lot of human errors. Um, previously, and even sometimes today, AVR hasn't been measured during a patient's visit just because we don't have the technology to measure it accurately and um, efficiently. Orthopedic surgeons sometimes estimate the AVR angles based on their experience. And this isn't so ideal for new trainees just because they don't have the experience. So their estimation would be less accurate. 
Currently, there are semi-automatic algorithms and algorithms for CT scans available. However, semi-automatic algorithms still require the user to identify certain landmarks like the pedicles, which can be very challenging and can result in errors. CT scans, although more clear, expose much more ionizing radiation to the patient, which is harmful, so we want to avoid that. So our goal in this project was to create a completely automatic program to minimize these problems. To do that, we're going to be using artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has already been really helpful in the medical field. It's been used in cardiology, radiology, dermatology, and even mental health. So for example, it was used to make an automated interpretation of an electrocardiograph where a specific pattern was linked to a set of diagnoses. AI has also been very useful in medical imaging like radiology, and it often uses convolutional neural networks, which is what we're going to be using in this project today. So on the right in figure seven, you can see one image of a healthy brain and two images of an unhealthy brain. And ideally, through AI, we can input these images into a program and the program would be able to determine whether the brain was healthy or unhealthy. So given all this information, the objective of our project is to develop an efficient automatic machine learning algorithm to measure the axial vertebral rotation on spinal radiographs. The process we took started with the spinal column segmentation shown in the image on the screen. A segmentation is when the network creates a mask which highlights the region that you want to identify. So for example, in the image on the top right, you can see an x-ray image with the spinal column highlighted in yellow and that spinal column would be our segmentation. We then moved on to a vertebral body segmentation for each vertebrae from T1 to L5 and then a pedicle segmentation for each of those vertebrae. Once we had all the parameters and segmentations, we can move on to the actual AVR calculation. So for the spinal column segmentation network, um, the spinal column from T1 to L5 was identified. This is shown in figure eight. We used 55 posterior anterior x-ray images for training and 10 for testing. We also applied a contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization pre-processing filter. So this is shown on figure nine, the left being the original image and the right being after the filter was applied. As you can see, after the filter is applied, the spinal column is a lot more distinct and easier to identify. We also use data augmentation such as flipping and rotation of the images just, just to increase the data set and diversify the images. The point of data augmentation is so that the network would be no, more knowledge in diverse images and would be able to segment the desired part for a wider range of images. So there were 55 images in total and we used 400 epochs. So in total, the network went through 22,000 images and applied data augmentation to each of those images. After the network predicted the spinal column segmentation, we applied some post-processing techniques such as binary closing, which closed any gaps or holes in the segmentation so that it was one complete connected region. For the vertebral body segmentation, network individual vertebral bodies from T1 to L5 were segmented. This is shown in figure 10. 221 vertebrae images were used for training and 44 were used for validation. Just like the spinal column segmentation network, that CLA-HE pre-processing filter was applied and data augmentation and post-processing was also applied. For this network, we used a iterative approach to find each vertebral body um, in the spinal column. So we started by looking two thirds down the spine and um, identifying the vertebrae in that region, which was typically T12. We then moved up the spine and found each vertebral body in the thoracic region of the spine up to T1. And then we went back to T12 and identified each vertebral body moving down up to L5. This iterative process was based on the quality of the segmentation, which was determined by comparing a diverse range of masks of standard vertebrae to the segmentation and using the minimum distance between the points of the standard masks and the points of the segmentation to determine the quality. If the quality wasn't good, the program would recrop that section and resegment. We then moved on to the pedicle segmentation network. So all the pedicles from T4 to L4 were identified. This is just because Stokes method only applied to those specific vertebrae. We used 220 vertebrae images for training and 26 for validation. No pre-processing was applied um, just because we found that the pedicles were a lot easier to identify without the filter. And again, data augmentation was applied and post-processing was applied. 
For this specific network, the network would produce a bunch of segmentations that could be possible pedicles. So we use post-processing to grab the two connected regions most likely to be pedicles. After we had all the segmentations, we found the minimum width of the vertebral body and therefore the center of the vertebral body. We then found the distance of the from the pedicles to the center of the vertebral body, which is variables A and B in equation three. And the width to height ratio, which is W over H in equation three was already given to us through Stokes method. We then could apply equation three to calculate the AVR angle. Figure 14 just summarizes the parameters I mentioned. So to test this program, we used eight spinal radiographs, which is 104 vertebrae as there were 13 vertebrae per um, spinal column. Uh, the AVR range for all of these test um, vertebrae went from ne negative 19 to 11 degrees. Manual AVR measurements were done with the rater who had 20 plus years of experience using a semi-automatic algorithm and automatic AVR measurements were found using the developed convolutional neural network algorithm that we, we created. We then compared the um, automatic and manual measurements by finding the mean absolute difference, conducting a regional analysis, and using the blonde Altman plot. So on this slide, you can see three images, the left being the spinal column segmentation, and then the top right being the vertebral body segmentation, and the bottom right being the pedicle segmentation. For each of these images, there are two pictures of an x-ray. The left has the predicted segmentation from the network, and the right has a true segmentation that we created to compare. And as you can see, our networks were very capable of performing these segmentations as the predicted segmentation was very similar to the true segmentation. The mean absolute difference between the automatic and manual measurements was 3.4 plus minus 3.6 degrees. 86 out of 104 vertebrae were within clinical acceptance. And clinical acceptance is just defined as a difference being less than five degrees. Uh, five degrees. It took about two minutes per spine um, to calculate the AVR angle for each of those vertebrae. In table one, table one shows the percent of automatic measurements within clinical acceptance to the manual measurements. And as we can see, the main thoracic performed the best, being at 89.6%, which was expected because Stokes method is typically more um, accurate for the middle section of the spine. Here's the blonde Altman plot comparing the automatic and manual measurements. The bias or mean difference was 0 0.16 degrees and 95% of the data was within two standard deviation, which means that the automatic and manual measurements had a really strong correlation with little bias. The error doesn't change much based on the severity as you can see on the right and left sides of the graph. In the future, we could conduct a larger clinical study on this program and testing vertebrae with AVR angles closer to negative 25 to 25 degrees. We could also focus on creating an automatic algorithm for other parameters such as the kyphotic and the lordotic angle measurements as I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation. We could also work on using these parameters to create a 3D reconstruction of the spine which would be very helpful in the future. So in conclusion, an, a convolutional neural network algorithm was developed which can automatically measure the axial vertebral rotation angles in posterior anterior radiographs within two minutes per spine. 83% of the automatic measurements were within clinical acceptance. And in addition to the AVR angles, the program also outputs the segmentations as well, which can serve two purposes. One being so that the clinician can determine how accurate the AVR angle is. If the clinician determines that the segmentations weren't good, then they could um, Remeasure the AVR angle manually, and two being that these segmentations could be used for a 3D reconstruction. I would like to thank the University of Alberta where the research was conducted, SWIST for allowing me to share my research, and our sponsors Alberta Innovates, Wickery, and NSERC. I'd also like to thank the um, Edmonton Scoliosis Research Group for all the x ray images used in the program, and lastly, Solvin Sigurdsson, who assisted on the spinal column segmentation network. And here are some of my references. Thank you all for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, I can answer them right now. And if I don't have time to answer any of your, or some of your questions, my email is provided on this slide. So you can always shoot me an email and I'll reply. Wonderful, thank you, Irina. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I would like to pass it over to our judges now for their Q&A with you. So I'm not sure if either one of you would like to start and maybe I'll leave it in your capable hands. Gabriela, do you want to go first this time? Yeah, no problem. I can go first. So first of all, thank you for the lovely presentation. I really enjoyed it. So I was very curious about the choice of the network because I, I was curious if you tried other networks and I would like more details of the networks that you chose you chose for the different stages of the project. Yeah, so I actually have an extra slide just for that. Um, so we did use UNETs and this is just because um, for multiple studies, we found that UNETs were very good for medical image detection. Um, the units are able to um, preserve the topo topology of images while reducing the computational complexity of the network. So as the image goes down um, through the convolutional layers and through the max pooling layers, they um, get a little bit more blurry. So on in these steps where the less blurry images are concatenated with the more blurry images, the network is able to pick up on those more broad details from those more blurry images and those more finer details from those less blurry images. So this is kind of why we chose this unit architecture. We also found a study that used this specific unit architecture for the automation of the Cobb angle on radiographs. And since our program is very similar, where we are analyzing radiographs and the spinal column, we thought that this would be a good architecture for that. Okay, thank you. And here you are showing the parameters you chose for your network. How did you choose these parameters? Did you take them from the previous work, from the related work? Or was it something that you worked on? Yeah, yeah so um, these parameters were more of a guess and check type thing. So we kind of chose a parameter and tried training the network and seeing if it worked. There were a couple of cues we could go off of. So for the learning rate, if um, once we trained the network, if the net, if the training curve was spiky or if it diverged, that would mean to decrease the learning rate. Or if it was taking a really long time to train, but it was training well, then we would know to increase the learning rate. So things like that. And for, um, yeah, for the number of epochs, we just found the optimal stopping point. So where the validation loss was at its lowest right before it overfit to the network, so. Okay, great, thank you. And also, Continuing on this, I think in your first network, you didn't use a validation set. And then in the second one, you used a validation set. I was wondering what was the reason for this? Yeah, so for the spinal column segmentation network, we only used a test set. This is just because um, the AVR measurement itself is more reliant on the vertebral body segmentation and the pedicle segmentation. The spinal column is more used to find where, or to used to find the vertebral body location so we can iterate up and down the spinal column. So therefore, the spinal column doesn't have to be as accurate. And we found that once we trained it for 400 epochs, it was already doing more than um, enough. So that's why we didn't really include a validation set for that network, but for the vertebral body segmentation networks and the pedicle segmentation networks where it has to be a little bit more accurate, we decided to include a validation set so we could find the optimal stopping point of training. Okay, thank you. And I had another question. So, yeah, in your in your presentation, you sh you said that the data set was manually annotated by an expert clinic clinician. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering. I mean, this this would be a really good tool for younger clinicians. And I was wondering if you have looked or are thinking into looking at comparing the performance of your network with how a young clinician would perform it. Yeah, that's definitely something we can look into. We decided to just look at um, the expert clinician for right now because the manual measurements would be um, more accurate. So then when we compare the automatic measurements, we'd have a better idea of the accuracy. But we... Um, for the automatic algorithm, anyone could be using it. So the experience doesn't really matter too much since there's no user interaction, but we could definitely look at comparing it to manual measurements of someone with a little bit less experience. Yeah, I thought it would really show like the advantages of your model rather not, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, no problem. And uh, mm. Yeah, you were talking about the um, clinical efficiency of your algorithm, and it was around 83%. Mm -hmm. 
Do you know why there was like almost 20% that was kind of mitigating the performance? So I was wondering if you, you looked at these these 20 percent and what could be the reason for the algorithm not performing well in that case yeah so once we finished um testing the program we looked at those cases where the avr angle wasn't as accurate we found that it was mostly due to the vertebral body segmentation or the pedicle segmentation so sometimes the network would um, find pedicles from previous or vertebrae which wasn't as good or the vertebral body segmentation wouldn't be as accurate. And then when looking at these specific vertebrae, we found that they came from mainly two x-ray images. And so those two x-ray images didn't have as good quality as the other x-ray images. So I, I think our program is very reliant on the quality of the x-ray image. Okay, thank you so much for answering. I think I can pass to Nidhi. Yeah, thank you for the question. No problem. Um, thank you, Gabriela. So I did have some, you know, similar questions as Gabriela about, uh, um, you know, the epoch size was 400. How did you come to that number and all of that? And about mm -hmm. the hand annotated data sets, I'm not going to repeat those. And also, you know, why did you choose CNN for the medical images? Mm -hmm. I was, uh, um, so there were other questions about the data set that I'm going to ask you. So you said in the first uh, one or two slides, 3% of children have scoliosis. Uh, so is this 3% of uh, children in Canada uh, across the world or? Yeah, I, in Canada. Oh, within Canada, okay. So that would be helpful to mention. Just, mm -hmm. yeah. it, it doesn't have any impact on how we are judging you. It was just uh, something that will be helpful to you. I did have a question about what is the Stokes method, but you already covered that in another slide. Uh, I did want to ask you, what is contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization? Can you uh, describe that in a little more detail, please? Yeah, I can just pull up um, one of the features. Um, yeah, so contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization is a pre-processing filter that um, projects use for medical image segmentations to, tend to use. So this filter tends to bring out the edges and make it a little bit more clear. So it's easier for the network to learn how to detect these edges. Okay. So it kind of just makes the, it makes the contrast a little bit more higher and just so those edges are more clear. Okay. And is this like the standard approach within the field or is this something that again, was a choice that you made? Yeah, so sort of assumptions? Of, yeah, so there's a lot of pre-processing filters out there but when looking at the different studies, I think we found one that used the contrast to the adaptive histogram equalization filter. So we tried implementing that and we noticed that it worked a lot better. So that's. Okay. Um, then I have uh, questions about your, uh, your test data, sorry, your, your training data set. So mm -hmm. did you say that the training data set was hand annotated by clinicians? The training, oh, the training data set I would. Or the entire data set. Sorry? Or was that the entire data set, which was, you know, pre-trained, I'm sorry, pre-annotated by, by the clinicians, if I understood that correctly? Like segmentations of them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so um, my prof, professor who has a lot of experience in this would train me in identifying the spinal column and the vertebral body. So I would create these segmentations and masks for training purposes. And then if I had any trouble, I could always go to him and get him to recheck my work okay so that was one of the things i wanted to uh, i'm sorry about the background noise but i do want to ask this mm -hmm. um so did anybody or um so, so this is like based on your experience um mm -hmm. did anybody validate or did anybody double check these these values because then because then there's also an issue of uh you know user error or or you know, operator error, whatever it's called in your field. Yeah. Uh, but those kind of errors can creep in. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. In certain so, scenarios. Yeah. So I have another person working with me, Jason Wong, and um, once the network finished training, we would kind of go through the images together, and we'd also go through the training images together just to see if the segmentations looked good. Um, and yeah, if I did have any trouble, I could always 
you know, send these segmentations to my professor and get him to check it as well. So we had a couple eyes just to look over those training images. I see. Um, the other question that I have about is uh, the validation of your results. So mm -hmm. once you, you know, finish the project, uh, you know, uh, where you are right now, did some, did you share it with the, I'm so sorry. Did you share it with the clinicians who um, shared the data set with you to begin with, just to, you know, kind of get their, uh, their you know feedback on uh, how valuable or how useful would this be you know just kind of help you with uh, improving the project or getting you know like a feedback loop and uh, what you're doing how useful is it going to be to the clinicians who are the actual end user of the project mm -hmm. yeah so i presented this work to um, the edmonton scoliosis research group and we got their feedback from there and i think my professor is also part of that group so he's kind of the middleman, so he would always be able to, you know, give the information back and forth and update that's, them. That's very good, that's excellent. Uh, what was the timeline of the project? So yeah, um, there was a previous student who also worked on this project, um, his name was Sullivan, and he, I believe he worked on it last year. I'm not completely sure about that, but I only started on this project in January. And so I think it finished maybe around May. Okay, sounds great, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Pina. Okay, thank you for the questions. Wonderful, thank you. So I would just like to remind our audience, we do have the chat box available. If you have any questions you'd like to drop in there, now is your time. And we know we do just have a few questions for you. Um, you spoke briefly on the future works of this project, but can you tell me a little bit more about what the plans are eventually it would be to implement this in the real world. Can you tell me a little bit about what that would look like or how you go about doing that? For the the automatic algorithms or for? For um, you, yeah. Or for this project itself. For the, sorry, for this project itself. Yeah, so this project we hope um, gets used in scoliotic clinics so they can give, they can calculate the AVR angles while the patient is actually at the clinic so they can give a better diagnosis. So mm -hmm. that's hopefully our goal, yeah. Awesome. And is this project in collaboration with any other companies? Um, we have some sponsors, but it's mostly the University of Alberta and Alberta Health Services. Okay, thank you. Uh, those are the questions we have in our chat box at this time, unless anyone else would like to come forward and ask anything. I think we have your professor, did you say, was watching here today, so. Yeah. He probably doesn't have any questions for you. <laughs> Anything else comes up from our judges or from Louise? Anything on your end? Uh, no, I'm good. I think, uh, Gabriela, if you have any question, uh, Nidhi has to go. So if you have any question, Gabriela. No, I think I'm okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, with that, um, we'll leave it at that then. Thank you, Vila, for your wonderful presentation. That was really fascinating. And I would also like to thank you, Gabriella, for joining us and Nina for joining us as our judges today. Um, if you have any closing remarks, we would love to hear them. And then we can, I'll just pop up a few closing slides before we go. Yeah, I'd just like to thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to listen to my presentation and ask questions. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity. And thanks to everyone in the audience as well. Yeah, thank you for being here with us today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will just quickly share my screen again. Let's see if I can get my slides there. Okay. Um, are you seeing the right thing? Maybe I have to switch those again. There we go. So yeah, I just want to follow up and let everyone here know that we do have a few more science symposium events coming through the month of August. So if you would like to learn more about those, you can always follow Swiss on Eventbrite. And we have them all listed there. Uh, you can also always go to squist.ca forward slash events, and we have all of our events there. And the next one coming up is the last one in our machine learning category, and that is happening on August 4th. If you would like to look for some updates on the symposium, you can always head over to the Squist website as well and check out the Science Symposium catalog, and that will be periodically updated with more information about the symposium. 
With that being said, I will stop sharing my screen and um, Gabriel, any any closing remarks from your end before we go yes, today? Yeah, sorry. Um, I would like to thank Vina for the great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And good luck with your future work. You're doing a really great job. So I really look forward to you see your future endeavors in the field or wherever you would like to go. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Vina, for joining us today. We'll let you go and get on with the rest of your day. And hopefully we will connect again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Bye and take care. Yes. Thank you, Noreen.